Well, Boreda Paup, good morning, conference. Um, I don't have any songs or jokes, and I was a bit worried when I heard the music now, seeing that we've got these mics, that there was something going on that I wasn't aware of. So uh, quite relieved, and a big relief for you as well, I think, that we didn't have to get up and sing. <laughs> so Sharon has very clearly set out for us this morning the challenges our world and our communities are facing and how we, as a sector, are responding to those challenges. Indeed, the only thing that some seems certain at present is that we live in a time of great uncertainty. That uncertainty was captured by the Welsh artist Iwan Bala in this painting, which he painted the day after the EU referendum result in 2016. This was his own personal response. And it shows how the vote immediately divided the United Kingdom, with splits not just emerging between the four nations, but also within those nations. We immediately became, as he writes here, the disunited kingdom. And no wonder that we are yet to find a way forward. I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm scared scared by the deep divisions that are tearing families and communities apart, scared by the increase in racism and sexism and violence and hatred that we see daily, scared that the rich are getting richer and yet child poverty and homelessness are on the increase, and scared about the future of our planet in light of the climate crisis. But being scared is not always a bad thing. It can galvanise you sometimes to do the unexpected and to take action and to inspire you to be braver and bolder than you would have previously dared. And what I'm most looking forward to over the next two days is hearing about the ways in which we as a sector are responding to these challenges, whilst also exploring why we are compelled to do so, as well as others around us, including, of course, our next speaker, Farana. For me, this is a matter of ethics, both our personal ethic, ethics as citizens of this world, as well as the ethics of our institutions. And I'd like to explore with you this morning the role of the Code of Ethics, and therefore the ethics of the sector and the MA's Ethics Committee in all of this. When I was first asked to join the MA's Ethics Committee a few years ago, I must admit, I was slightly daunted by the pros prospect. The process of writing the current code of ethics was underway, and before my first meeting, I had no idea what to expect. After all, the Museum Association's code of ethics underpins the accreditation scheme for museums in the UK, and for many at the time, it was a document to fear, as you knew that breaching the code could mean the loss of accreditation. While the link between accreditation and the code remains in place, the revised Code of Ethics and accompanying guidance has, I hope, also freed museum professionals to be bolder and braver in how we work, as well as how we make decisions. Alongside stewardship of collections, the code places public engagement, public benefit, and individual and institutional integrity at its heart meaning that we have a duty to not only maintain and develop collections, but also to ensure they are used for public benefit. It therefore supports us in being unapologetic at times, and to be confident in stating, as Sharon mentioned, that museums are not neutral. And we've just seen countless examples of museum activism by Sharon just now. And if embraced by the institutions in which we work, it also empowers us to respond in a sorry, not sorry kind of way to some of the criticisms we receive when we work like this and if we are confident that what we are doing is ultimately for public benefit. Not everyone will be comfortable with our approach and I'm grateful to everyone who shared with me some of their own sorry, not sorry moments as museum professionals via Twitter earlier this week. You can see a selection of these tweets behind me now, and included in the examples sent to me are museum professionals 
defending the rights of children to laugh in museums, justifying why creationism isn't promoted in natural history museums, why we collect LGBTQ plus objects and stories, why we are more than okay with Muslim visitors praying in spaces within our museums, and why we welcome visitors in wheelchairs with breathing equipment into galleries just as much as we welcome anyone else. And we won't apologize if some people think these things hamper their visitor experience. These are our ethics. But to maintain our integrity, our activism and sorry, not sorry moments as individuals, though important, do not go far enough. And there are also bigger issues that we must now tackle as a sector. Hence the theme of this conference and my focus for the remainder of my address this morning. So let's first look at sponsorship. Of course, the political and financial context is crucial to this. As we all know, public funding has rapidly declined over the course of the last decade, and museums are having to income generate to sustain even core functions. Sponsorship has become not just a nice to have, but an essential, with some museums relying on sponsorship to simply keep their doors open. And you'll see here, the Code of Ethics rightly does not in any way prohibit this, but rather encourages museums to carefully consider offers of financial support. And I'll leave you to read the rest by yourselves if you don't know the code off by heart. So you could argue that in relation to sponsorship, we say all the right things within our Code of Ethics to plus eight campaigners, but we're also suitably vague so that museums can justify their sponsorship agreements so long as they have carefully considered and looked at the ethical standards of the sponsors. And here is where the dilemma lies. Every museum is different, and as such, the sponsorship agreements with which each one enters into will be different. As an ethics committee, it is impossible for us to come up with a definitive list of ethical versus unethical sponsors, as this would be different for every museum but we are also conscious that both museums and the public are asking for greater clarity. We have therefore committed over the course of the next year to look at what more we can do as part of the Code of Ethics to support museums in reaching those decisions and also how they communicate those decisions to the public. However, it is also our ethical responsibility to be clear about the need for continued public investment in museums so that the work we do within our communities and the con contribution we make to the economy of each of our nations can continue without being compromised. Cuts to culture and heritage must not be inevitable. And I would argue that the sustainability of the sector is, not the responsibility of, is also the responsibility of each of our governments, not just us as museums. But as we know, the issue of sustainability is not just a matter of finances. And to be sustainable, we must also ensure that we are relevant to the communities we serve, which brings me to the other big themes which will be discussed over the course of the conference. Many of you in this room responded and contributed to the MA's Collections 2030 research project launched last year and which resulted in the publication Empowering Collections. Within the report, the Ethics Committee was given the task of establishing new guidance for the sector, to ensure that museums take a proactive approach to the reinterpretation and decolonizing of collections. A working group has been set up to take this forward, chaired by Rachel Minnett, and I can't wait to see how this work progresses. No matter how uncomfortable it makes some people within the sector feel, I firmly believe that we have no choice but to confront the legacies of empire and I'm looking forward to all of the sessions at the conference, which will showcase some great examples of how museums are embracing this important issue, whilst also being honest about some of the challenges and resistance to this work that remains. It is the only way progress can be achieved. Similarly, it can be uncomfortable to discuss issues surrounding the disposal of collections, working with countries that may have a different view on the right of its citizens to us, and the ethics surrounding our workforce, all other key things that will be discussed over the next two days. And whilst we are likely to leave Brighton with more questions than answers, I am confident, confident that the seeds planted here over the next two days 
will lead to greater action being taken to tackle some of the issues we have perhaps tended to fudge in the past because they too seemed too big to get to grips with. We must also support one another as we go about this work and be ready for the fact that not everyone is in favour of us taking clearer positions on issues such as sponsorship, repatriation, decolonisation and disposal of collections. As this article by David Aranovich and published in the Times on the 22nd of August illustrates. In it, he equates museum activism and ethical positioning to self-harm. And there is a clear suggestion that in this time of financial uncertainty, that we should take what we can from whoever is willing to fund us and protect our treasures, irrespective of their origin at all costs. We have also seen some prominent museum directors take similar defensive positions when challenged on issues of sponsorship or repatriation. Hence the need for an honest conversation about the issues we all face and how we should take these forward as a sector with our communities rather than for them. Sharon mentioned Elaine Human Gideon and her inspiring speech at last year's conference in Belfast. And I wanted to reference the list which she shared with us of ways museums can bring about change. Sharon very kindly shared a picture of these on Twitter last year, and I'll reshare them later this morning for anyone who's yet to see them, as I know you can't see them clearly here. But there's one in particular that has stuck with me since then that I wanted to repeat this year, which is build a network and stay close to colleagues so that you are not so lonely. Change is a lonely and often assaultive business. So if you don't already have one, build that network here in Brighton at this conference. Embrace the debates we will have and connect with other people working in the sector who are grappling with the same ethical issues as you are. Take the opportunity to reflect on your personal ethics and how you are applying them to your work and within your organisation. And help us as an ethics committee and museums association to understand how best we can support your own ethical practice. Let us be honest. The challenges we, as well as the communities which we serve, are facing are not easy ones to tackle. And there will be times when we get things wrong. But that's not a reason to stay as we are and keep doing things as we've always done. In challenging times, we must also challenge ourselves. Museums are not neutral. And we should embrace that fact. Diach. <laughs>